Welcome to the podcast. I'm your host, RJ Carbone. You are listening to BD4, where there's no better way to get your Yankees and Knicks analysis. We also do MMA. Yanks every series, Knicks every game, MMA on occasion. Let's get to it. Anthony for three. Okay, welcome to the show. Welcome to episode 634 of the podcast. Doing Yankees, uh, Yankees, doing Knicks, doing Knicks Pistons in this episode. This episode will be, for those of you who are on YouTube, audio only as you can see. Uh, I usually do audio only episodes for the first of back-to-backs when it comes to Knicks games. This way... You know, it's it's the games are very close apart, so it's like they don't have time really to set up. I usually like taking the time to set up and take notes and get everything ready with my software, and it takes about a little bit. So I record the next night. So this is like the next morning. I'm kind of this is what we do for back to backs. We we like to get it out early so it has some kind of shelf life. So welcome to the podcast, doing Nick's Pissons. These episodes, the first of back-to-backs, are usually shorter also. So this will be about 20, 30 minutes tops, I would say. Um, although a lot of the time we say that and we end up going the full 45. But I doubt. We'll see. <laughs> welcome to the show. Uh, the Knicks last night, Jesus Christ, they, they, they beat the Pistons. They won. 113-111. Um, This was supposed to be a road game initially uh, because of the NBA Cup, but the league was nice enough to actually give the Knicks uh, the respect to play this game at the Garden because of the schedule. Um, This was the first time both of these sides met since the trade that they made with each other. Um, I can't say that the Knicks... um, trade pieces outperformed who the Pistons got last night. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, But the Knicks did come away with the win to pick up this first win of the back-to-back. And they were struggling throughout this game. Like, early on in the game, Brunson was the only one who was going offensively. Uh, But then the Nova Knicks started coming alive and contributing throughout the night. The Knicks had a very tough time on those Cade Cunningham pick and rolls. Uh, A lot of miscommunication, just uh, making bad reads, and Cade Cunningham in the first three quarters torched the Knicks with 29 points of his 32 points. Um, You know, fourth quarter comes, and the Detroit Pistons newly acquired players, former Knicks, really propel them to the win. Uh, Late in the third, you know, Fournier gets a big stop on Brunson, Malachi Flynn had some second half moments in this game, but it was Quinton Grimes. Um, Quinton Grimes in the fourth quarter. Good God. He, uh, <laughs> you could tell he wanted a man. He was looking toward the Nick bench after every basket he made. And um, good for this kid. You know, he wasn't getting an opportunity here. You know, I, Don't think he was that good anyway. I think he was a bit overrated. Um, Love the defense. Three-point shooting's up and down. But in this game, he at least performed like the player who Knicks fans thought he could be. 14 points at the end of the day for Grimes. He knocked down three of six from downtown. Um, 
a steal, three blocks. Uh, yeah, he was big in that four, fourth quarter. He hits the big three-point shot to give Detroit the lead. Um, the Knicks then respond with big baskets and big stops, big rebounds by the Nova Knicks. Um, he had a massive stop at the basket from iHeart and Precious at the Ram. Like they, they, that one possession with a minute and change where one of them gets the block, the other one's just, you know, deterring penetration and protecting the basket. That lineup is it's good defensively, man. Um, but then Grimes responds again with a big finish at the basket with 37 seconds left, cuts through the lane, and he converts, and it's 110 or 111 to 110. The Pistons are up at that point. And then you get this insane chaotic sequence, which if you're a Knicks fan, you seem to get one of these sequences, I don't know, every couple of weeks to end the game. Um, Right after the Grimes basket, Brunson takes it up the floor. Uh, Dante DiVincenzo screens the switch to get Cade Cunningham the mismatch onto Brunson. Brunson isos Cade, misfires from three, Hart grabs the rebound, he loses it. Grimes jumps on it before it goes out of bounds, saves it, but then he loses it. Isaiah Hartenstein's in the middle, he grabs the ball, takes a couple dribbles, picks it up, hits Dante up top of the key. Dante swings it to Brunson on the right wing, bad pass, Uh, Thompson picks it off. Dante... After Thompson kind of loses it a little bit, he makes contact with Thompson while he's diving on the floor. Clear contact. There was no whistle. Um, And they keep playing. Brunson ends up coming up with it. He makes a good read and finds Josh Hart. And then Josh Hart, down in the left side of the paint, comes through with the game-winning finish through contact with two seconds left. Um, (laughs) I mean, it it was just... Yeah, insane is probably the best way to describe that sequence. Um, And you know what? If you think the Knicks got screwed over against Houston, this is kind of a makeup, right? There you go. You you lost the Houston game when you you probably should have won. Well, you won the Detroit game that you probably should have lost. Um you know, and and rightly so, Monty Williams is upset. Uh that guy Listen, he's been the worst coach in the NBA. He does not want this job. He, I mean, that's that's the reason he declined it first. Um, yeah, he's upset, and he's bitching about it. Um, Quentin Grimes was clearly upset. Um, Evan Fournier got booed. He's triggered. I, you know, it's whatever. Um, the officials admitted post game that they made the mistake. I'm sure the two minute report is already out. I'm sure they admitted it there, Um, but I respond to that by saying who gives a shit. Um, A win is a win is a win, and this this was my same exact response when the Knicks lost to the Rockets, so can't really give me shit there. A win is a win, and a loss is a loss, Um, and the Knicks won this game. Um, The Knicks played bad basketball. They were bailed out by the whistle. I don't care. I want the win. At the end of the day, I want my team scoring more points than the other team because of standings. And at this point in the, in the uh, season, that's all the Knicks should be focusing on is seeding. Style points, that segment of the season has gone. We know who the Knicks are. We know which teams they can match up with. We know who they are at this point. At this point, it's about getting healthy and then winning as much games as possible without all these guys so that you can get a favorable matchup in a playoff series. So the Knicks, the only thing they need to do, I don't care how ugly it is, how pretty it is, they just need to keep winning and stay afloat. They're a 500 team right now. That's what they've been. They've been mediocre as ever without Julius and OG. So they just need to keep doing that. It's a, it's a slog watching this team now. It, the fun vibes are kind of gone. But at the end of the day, I just want wins. I know I sound like tips. Um, And so that's all I'm looking at. The Knicks won last night. Jalen Brunson, 
35 points, 12 assists. He actually had a bad game. He was very inefficient last night. Too many threes. Um, some bad decisions, turnovers, tough shots. Ran out of gas late in the fourth, right? And we're so used to Jalen being perfect down the stretch of games where it's like, well, we look up and, and we say this is a bad game for him. and The guy's got 35 and 12. So it's going to happen. Um, Dante DiVincenzo, big baskets throughout the game. 21 points, 5 for 10 from 3. What else is there to say about Dante? He's just been everything and and then some. Um, but I'm actually going to give the game ball among the starting players to Josh Hart. Um, hold on one second. I don't know where that went. Um, let me see. I don't know if you're watching on YouTube. For some reason, the slide that was playing just disappeared. Fuck. I don't know how long that was, but let's see if we can get this back up. Give me one second. Um, whoops. That's going to bother me. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. Put it on a loop. All right. Sorry about that. Um, for a few minutes there, it was down. I'm going to give the game ball to Josh Hart. Josh Hart had 23 points, eight rebounds, six assists, two steals, a block, was three for five from three, and he played 42 minutes last night. Um, shocker. Gets his ninth game ball of the season. This was probably the most Josh Hart game ever. Um, I mean, he was flying for rebounds, pushing in transition again. Huge hustle plays, especially in crunch time, right? He had the play leading up to the basket. He had the basket, and then he had the rebound after he missed the free throw, grabs the board at the buzzer. Um, very Josh Hart stuff. I loved, and I love, the three-point game of recent. Um, he's now 7 for 15 on his threes in three games since the All-Star break. Each of those games, he's taken five threes. He's taking more. He's making more. And that's the confidence that we need Josh Hart to shoot with. Um, the defense, listen, the defense is never going to respect Josh Hart from three. They're always going to help off of him and onto the action. So how do you counter that? You at least have to make them pay by taking those shots and knocking them down. And that's what he's doing. And I don't, I don't need Josh Hart to shoot 7 to 15, 50% from three the rest of the year, but I just need him to be adequate. Be confident, take them, and be adequate. Um, and when you get that open space, shoot the damn three. That's that. It's it's the volume for me that I'm looking at. It's the it makes second. It's the takes first. Um, because maybe the more he takes, the defense does have to respect him at least a little bit. Um, he, he's very good at when they do give him that space, uh, you know, he'll attack the closeout and get to the basket. But I'm very, very glad to see him taking these threes the last few games. I think that's only going to open up the offense, you know, for as long as he has to start next to Precious and Sims, he has to be doing things like this. So... Credit to Josh Hart, who had a great game last night. I feel like I don't give him enough respect, so I will give him credit there for having a hell of a game and saving the Knicks down the stretch. Go to the bench. Um, you know, the bench didn't really play a giant role in this game. They all had some moments. Um, Jericho Sims, I feel like, was the best uh, of the second team. He had two points, six rebounds, a couple assists. He was a plus two in 20 minutes. Two game balls now on the season for Jericho. I like the defense. Continues to stay in front of his assignment. I love the fact that he's got this, he's got such quick feet, so he's able to move laterally. Uh, so he's able to move laterally, um, which makes him a, a good switch big. 
Um, so I thought he held it down defensively, and he was great on the O boards. Four offensive rebounds last night for Jericho. So he did a nice job. Other guys on the bench, uh, in particular, the early returns right now on, on Bogey and Burks, bad. Uh, it's still bad. They've been bad for since they've came over. Now it's it's a very short sample. But Alec Burks in particular has been fucking brutal. Uh, His decision-making has been terrible. He's taking and missing bad shots, just out of rhythm shots that don't come in the half-court offense, directionless isolations, pick-and-rolls going nowhere. He had a terrible turnover early in the fourth quarter, which led to that Grimes basket. And, like, not to be that guy, but I'm going to be that guy. The Knicks went into the deadline needing a second unit initiator, and they left the deadline still without one. That's kind of why I wanted Malcolm Brogdon. Um, <laughs> but, you know, he was never moved anyway. But, like, I'm, I, I'm just... All I can do at this point when it comes to Burks is pray that when or if the Knicks get healthy, Tibbs has enough sense to put Burks back into that off-wing role. Weak side spacer, weak side spot-ups, DHO with Randall and iHeart, not as the pick-and-roll initiator. You can't have Burks quarterbacking an offense because it it's, it's worse than it was two, three years ago. Now, Bogdanovich has been less bad, more so-so. But you could tell Tom Thibodeau doesn't love playing him. Just you know, because of the defense, obviously. Like He's the last sub to check in. And then down the stretch of this game, when the Knicks, uh, you could argue, needed offense and shooting more than anything, Precious Achua was in the game over him, and Precious wasn't having a good game. I don't think Bogey's... Like, maybe when the Knicks are healthy, you got everybody here, you're able to hide Bojan um, defensively, and, and he could play versus second teams instead of facing starters so consistently. Um, but maybe Stagger. I don't know. I, I would actually like to see him in a starting lineup over Precious Achua. I, wanna, I know the defensive drop-off, we just talked about that, but like... Maybe double down on offense because it, it'll give you a lot more spacing in that starting unit. It'll help Brunson out. It, it's kind of brutal watching Precious sometimes because I love his defense that he provides when he's in a switch and when he's at the four. But offensively, Precious Tachua, it's like you can't be a four in today's game and bring little to no spacing, little to no offense. And same with Jericho. But like, I guess Precious is a little better because he can knock down one of every five threes or something. But I would like to see if not starting that lineup with Brunson, Dante, uh, Hart, Boyan, and I Hart a little more. You know, and it's a lineup that I think can still hold it down defensively if I Hart ever gets back to playing his normal minutes and he's in rhythm. Um, But at the end of the day, when it comes to these two guys... I'm not super concerned just because, as I've been saying for like five, six episodes in a row now, they're not here really for the playoffs. They won't be playing much in a playoff series anyway. It's hard to put a number on that, but I would say, like, okay, so you're going to have Brunson, Dante, OG, Randall, and iHeart if they get back. And then let's say everybody's healthy. You'll have Hart and Mitch on the bench. And then Bogey and Burks will be your four, uh, your your uh, seven and or your eighth and ninth men. They're probably going to be playing fifteen minutes or less. Your eighth man's going to be playing maybe fifteen minutes, and your eight point five man. Let's be honest, there's not really a true ninth man. Your eight point five man is probably going to be playing single figures. That's maybe going to be Burks because Brunson's going to be getting forty three minutes probably. So. That's also why I don't sweat about, like, you know, folks are are kind of getting nervous about, like, is Precious and is Deuce going to be pushed out of the rotation come 
playoff time when everybody's back, if everybody's back. Um, I, I just think, like, they're going to be playing minimally anyway. They're situational. You know, it's going to be your five starters plus Hart and Mitch who are going to be taking the bulk of the minutes. In a playoff series, you're going to play the very best you have. And those are the two weak points right now. So they're not going to play much. And that's, this is assuming everybody's healthy. Like Mitchell Robinson, no guarantee to come back. And if he does, I wouldn't be shocked if he was on a limit. You know, they want to protect him. And even if they plan to move him this offseason, you can't imagine they're going to try to you know overplay him and, and risk him getting hurt. To hurt his value. Like OG on an OB, the timetable every day, it seems to be getting pushed back. Today, we, we heard two, three weeks again. That was like two weeks ago. Fucking, so I don't think everybody's going to be back. I, I don't. I think this is, that's why my my outlook on this team has changed over the last couple of weeks. That's why I've had more of a negative tone regarding this team. I don't think the 2024 Knicks are making any kind of run. I think they're toast. I think they can maybe, maybe slide into a playoff spot, cling on to the sixth seed, and get into the dance that way. But I don't think they're making any noise. I, I, I've kind of given up on the conference finals run. I don't think everybody's going to be healthy. I, I don't think that even if guys get back, they're going to be 100% like Randall with how physical he plays. I know we've, we've talked about this over and over. It's kind of a boring, over over stated topic. But like, yeah, that that's that's... I don't know, man. There's a reason I've been doing Yankees episodes recently, so fuck it. It's it's not looking great, uh, in my opinion. But that's it. We'll head to our break. When we get back in a break in a few minutes, we'll wrap it up with our trivia. Stay with us here on episode 634 of BD4. Be right back. Hey there. Thanks for listening in so far. If you enjoy this episode, please give us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. And if you're on YouTube, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks so much. You can follow us on social media as well. On Instagram, we're at BD4Pod and at Rob J. Carbone. On X, we're at BD4Pod and at RJCBD4. And on Facebook, we're BD4. If you're interested in our website, just go to www.bd4blog.com. You can subscribe to our blog on there right on the front page. Just like on the podcast, we cover Yankees, Knicks, and MMA. Also on our website are the links to the different platforms for the podcast. Thanks so much. Studio 69 Productions is a podcast production agency created by Leo Rodriguez to allow content creators to market their podcast. It's an online platform that will market your podcast or any other project that you're working on. Get in touch with Leo Rodriguez from Studio 69 Productions. You can find Studio 69 Productions on Instagram at Studio69NJ. Studio 69 Productions, where dreams are heard and born. Thanks for listening to BD4, where there is no better way to get your Yankees and Knicks analysis. We also do MMA, Yanks every series, Knicks every game, and MMA on occasion. All right, let's wrap this thing up, episode 634, with our trivia question of the day. For this episode, our trivia question, when was the last time the Pistons beat the Knicks at MSG? I guess I should rephrase. What year was it 
the last time the Pistons beat the Knicks at MSG. What year was it the last time the Pistons beat the Knicks at MSG? Let me know the answer wherever you can reach me. If you get the answer correct, I'll give you a shout out in the next episode. But this one is over, folks. The Knicks win 113-111 against the Pistons last night. Just one. Just snuck away with it. But um, that's it for this one. Quick 25-minute show. Who cares about Knicks Pistons? Uh, we will definitely be back with a more in-depth episode when it comes to uh, tonight's game. After tonight's game, we'll have an episode out tomorrow night talking Knicks Pelicans, uh, and it's, it's they better like I, I need this team to win some games against like because they've they've looked like like a non-NBA product against half adequate or better teams w- without Randall and OG. Like they need to start looking like a NBA team again. Even even last night they weren't playing to that level. So that'd be nice. But just win, as I said, just win. So we'll see. All right, folks. Thank you. I'll see you next. I'll see you in the next show. That's it. Later. This episode was brought to you by Anchor. Hey there! If you stayed the entire way through, we thank you immensely for it. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and that you come back for the next episode real soon. Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, download these episodes, and share them with your friends as well. BD4 is a five-star podcast simply because of you, and we'd like to keep it that way. Have a wonderful day. Go Yankees and go Knicks!